We have two solar storms on their way to Earth with a fast wind chaser. And some big regions are rotating into Earth view, and they've already shown that they are big solar storm and big flare producers. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week picks up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, look at all the active regions in Earth view. We are saying goodbye to region 3806 and 3807 as they rotate to the sun's far side, but we'll get back to those in a minute because they're making a ruckus on the sun's far side. In actuality, we've been paying close attention to this kind of cluster of, of active regions here with some filaments that look like they were going to erupt, but thus far, most of the eruptions have been southward. But take a look at region 30. 821 as it begins to emerge here there's a filament that lets go whoosh right there did you see that that is an earth directed solar storm in fact as we take a look at coronagraphs you can see much of the material here launching to the northeast of earth but there's a little bit of something right here so this is an earthward directed solar storm and we're expecting it to hit us any time now and on top of all of that you can see we've got a little bit of activity from these regions here region 3814 picks up in a little bit but Let's go back to region 3806. You can see it on the sun's far side begin to kind of get really active right there. That was a big solar eruption. And then you can see a big whoosh that pop right there. Both of these far-sided eruptions have created radiation storms that we're dealing with right now. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but it shows you that we've got some activity that's about to rotate into Earth view. In fact, the one on the uh, uh, that's just behind the east limb, it fired off back on the third, it fired off a big X-class flare. This is an X2.4 flare, and you can see from the Styx instrument where it was located on the sun at that time, it was rotating almost center disk on the sun's far side. Then, Back on the 5th, we had an almost M8 and another X2.4 class flare from the same region. And again, when we take a look at where it was located, well, now it's rotated past center disk on its way to coming back around in Earth view. And then, believe it or not, on the 7th, it fires off an M class flare and an, another radiation storm. So we've actually got some big flare players on the sun's far side. This one's about to rotate into Earth view. You can see some activity here. This is from region 3806 that just rotated to the sun's far side. So this far side is definitely lighting up and we're expecting to see more. You can see these two regions right here that are going to rotate into Earth view. Meanwhile, we're not done yet with the Earth-directed solar storms. We've got region 3814 lights up a big solar eruption right here. You can hardly see that. But when we take a look at the coronagraphs, this is the stereo coronagraph. Again, much of the material is going kind of north of Earth, but you can see this really faint halo right here. So once again, we have yet another Earth-directed solar storm. This one's going to hit us sometime on the 12th. And so these are going to be back to back. And depending upon how closely they hit as a one-two punch, we could get some big storming even down to mid-latitudes. Now, switching to our full sun map, we take a look at SDO AIA imagery to see what's on the sun's front side, of course, but we also take a look at EUI imagery from Solar Orbiter to get an idea of what active regions might be lurking on the sun's far side. Now, as we set this map in motion, you can get oriented by looking at region 3806. That one is going to be rotating to the sun's west limb, but then also region 3821 and region 3814 as it rotates into view here. These were the two solar storm launchers that have those two Earth-directed solar storms that are coming toward us now. But also take a look at the sun's far side. We have two big active regions on the uh, what's about to become the east limb here. These are the regions that have been firing off those big X-class flares. And last time they were in Earth view, they were big flare players. That looks like we've had a lot of growth in these regions. So as they begin to rotate into Earth view again, expect that big solar flares are going to be back on the menu at R3 level radio blackouts. And for you Aurora photographers, even after we get these two solar storms hitting us, kind of dying down, we do have some big flare players and big solar storm players that are going to be rotating here into the Earth strike zone over this next week. So expect that we could have some big Earth-directed solar storms once again after all of this dies down. 
Now, as we switch to our radiation storm monitor, over the past week, we've actually had a bit of a radiation storm twice. This, these storms are from the big flare players on the sun's far side that are wreaking havoc there. Now, back on the second, we actually peaked at almost an S1 level, but things kind of died back down. Likely the radiation storm was much stronger on the sun's far side. But then we got hit again on the ninth by a second radiation storm. This one was from light, it was likely from region 3806 that's just disappeared around the sun's far side. But this one actually did peak up over the S1 level. It is dying down now. But as those Earth directed solar storms end up hitting Earth, there's a chance that this radiation storm level could peak back up close to the S1 level before it finally begins to die down completely. So, amateur radio operators and you GPS users, if you're at high latitudes, expect communication and navigation issues as long as this. Uh, uh, these levels are elevated, which will be easily over the next few days. And then stay on alert when those new regions rotate into Earth view, because we could get more of these. Now, returning to those two Earth-directed solar storms, we take a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we set this solar storm model in motion, you can see the solar storm being launched. This is the first of the two. This solar storm is being launched mainly to the west of Earth and slightly northward of Earth. But nonetheless, it manages to give Earth a direct hit. And this is expected to be late on the 10th, according to the NOAA model, but it might actually be a little bit later. In fact, as we switch to the NASA version of the model for this model run, again, we're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. As we set this model in motion, you can see the solar storm coming out here. It's going to hit Earth a little bit more of a direct hit than I think Na uh, NOAA's version has it, but it may be as far as early on the 11th by the time the solar storm hits. So we kind of have a bracketed window. Now, if this solar storm is a bit on the slow side, then that's going to be it. That's going to mean something because when we take a look at the next solar storm that's being launched, again, we're just looking at the NASA version because they have their model run out right now. NOAA, we're still waiting for their model run. You can see this second solar storm being a bit more of a direct hit. This storm should hit us late on the 8th, on the 12th. So it could be that these two solar storms kind of go back to back. And I don't know if they're going to influence each other, but what's going to happen is that Earth is going to be what we call preconditioned. So therefore, it's going to be kind of loaded. So when the second storm hits Earth, it's already kind of on a hair trigger. And so we could get stronger storming when this storm hits on the 12th. So war photographers, even if you're mid -lat at mid latitudes, you could definitely get a show. Uh, Aurora could definitely come down to, you know, deep into mid latitudes, and it could be an extended storm from basically late on the 10th clear to about the 13th or 14th before things calm down. So definitely keep your batteries charged. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the second quarter phase on our way to a full moon with a full moon being on the 18th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, you're going to have this bright companion to deal with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating those two solar storm hits coming back to back. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major storm conditions with up to about a 65% chance of a severe storm. This is going to be on the 12th because we're going to be calming down from one solar storm and then getting hit by the second. So likely the 12th will be when we have uh, the best chance for aurora, although we should be at high latitudes storming pretty much through the 13th. Then after that, right around the 14th, we'll be calming down a bit. We'll probably have a bit of a fast wind chaser. So we could still see Aurora clear through the 14th before things finally calm down on the 15th. And we'll be looking back at the sun for even more chances for solar storms. Now at mid latitudes, well, we're not, conditions aren't quite as strong, but we are expecting up to about a major storm on the 12th. Again, that's because we're gonna have back to back solar storms and the second one should be hitting right about here. We could have about a 20% chance of a severe storm, but that's being possibly a bit optimistic. We shall see. Meanwhile, things should then begin calming down on the 13th. We will get a bit of fast solar wind chaser, which might cause Aurora to be sporadically lingering at mid latitudes. So Aurora photographers, you do, even down at mid latitudes, get a decent chance to chase. So make sure you are ready. 
Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and the ones to watch this week are region 3814 and 3822, and of course the east limb, because we have those new flare players that are going to be coming on board. Our solar flux is sitting well into the 200s, and this means good radio propagation on Earth's dayside, but we do have some moderate noise levels, and this is likely going to continue over this next coming week with possible possibly it getting a little bit worse. NOAA is giving us about a 55% chance of M-class flares. This is at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout level over the next couple days, and a 15% chance of radio blackouts at the R3 level due to X-class flares. And likely that will boost just a little bit as we move into the latter part of this week because of those new regions rotating into Earthview. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect that the big radio blackouts are back on the menu and the bands will continue to worsen over this next week. So you're just going to have to grin and bear it. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at the D2 minor range, and this is for you aviators at flight level 360. We're also sitting at it just below the S1 storm level, just an elevated flux level for everybody else. And this is going to continue to be an issue over the next couple days. NOAA is giving us about a 50% chance of reaching S1 to S2 levels over the 24 hours. And on the 12th, I'm bumping this up to about a 90% chance because we have those Earth-directed solar storms that are moving through. But after that, things should quiet back down. And by about the 14th or the 15th, we should be back at the D1 normal range, assuming we don't have any more radiation storms launched from those new regions that are rotating into Earth view. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and high-risk passengers, please check those ICAO advisories often and make sure you take these conditions and consider them in your flight plans. So the space weather this week has gotten very active. We have two solar storms on their way to Earth, along with a fast wind chaser. This could give you aurora photographers some extended aurora, even down into mid-latitudes until about the 13th before things really calm down. So be sure to keep your batteries charged and keep your eyes on the skies. And now you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, things have been reasonably quiet for you, but things are beginning to get worse. Not only do we have those solar storms that are going to wreak havoc on Earth, Earth's night side, but now we have some new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view over the next couple days that are big flare players again. So expect R3 level radio blackouts to be back on the menu and possibly even more solar storms, as well as big radiation storms that then cause problems for you both in the north and the south poles in those high latitude regions. So just kind of grin and bear it and get through it over the next week. Things will calm down. And now you GPS users, well, things aren't looking all that great for you either right now. We have two Earth-directed solar storms that are going to give you GPS reception problems on Earth's night side, especially anywhere near Aurora. On Earth's day side, we have those new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view that are going to be giving big radio blackouts. So that could give you some GPS re reception problems near dawn and near dusk. And if you happen to be at high latitudes, well, we have those ongoing radiation storms that are giving us issues at the north and south polar regions. So just be careful and be vigilant all over and make sure that when that uh, those solar storms hit that you calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.